Well, thanks so much again for tuning in and for spending this time together with us as we continue to broadcast from St. Mark's here in Cardiff. I know this is a terribly inadequate way of communicating, and I'm so sorry for that. Uh, if it's any consolation, I know it's tiring to listen to. It's tiring to deliver as well. So I would ask your forgiveness for that and just pray that today, this may, in spite of all the limitations, be of some help to you and would be a blessing and lift your eyes, your mind, your heart to things above where Jesus reigns over all the universe from the throne of his almighty father. We've been seeing last week in this like first foundational parable, the parable of the sower, in which Jesus was setting out things about his kingdom, this glorious kingdom of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in which Jesus is the king, in which he lifts us up and brings us into the same relationship with his Father, which he has always had, and allows us to live his life with him, caught up into this kingdom that will never end. All the kingdoms of this passing world last 50, 100, even a 1,000 years, but this kingdom will never end, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And today, we're going to be going deeper as Jesus continues in the, the series of parables or riddles, as we might say from last time, Parables, just to refresh us, are not Jesus making things simple because, as we said, if that was the case, he wasn't very good at it because people again and again struggle to understand. No, deliberately hiding things in this riddle parable form so that we would either walk away and say, well, yeah, I, I don't have any time or energy or inclination to try and understand that. Or on the other hand, we would go to him as the disciples do, as we'll see again and again and again, and say, Lord, we need your help. Please explain these things to us. Please help us to understand. That's the sort of heart that we need and want, to humbly go to Jesus, to be our teacher and our guide, and our saviour, and to ask him to explain these things to us. Now, what he's going to do today, which is so helpful, is to be able to give us a different perspective on what's happening around us. I'm, I'm sure you're as much aware of it as I am, that there is a huge gap, often, between how things seem and how they really are. You know, the appearances of things and the realities. And if we only see the appearances or see things as they seem to be, we can be very troubled, very anxious, and even act in irresponsible and inappropriate ways in response to how we perceive things to be. So as we look around at the world at the moment, things are shaking and being changed in cataclysmic and like fundamental deep ways and not just the wider world the cultures nations but the church as well profound changes are happening and taking place within the institutional church particularly within this land the land of wales now there has been a decline in attendance across the church in wales in a catastrophic uh, level so between 1990 and 2019, the numbers of those that attended on average dropped from about 100,000 to around about 25,000. In anybody's estimation, that is catastrophic level of decline. And there have to be serious questions asked about what's going on. You know, what is it about what we're saying and what we're doing that just doesn't seem to be working? How are we to understand that? How are we to act by response? Of course, there are a lot of people that are very troubled by these things. And there are all kinds of responses that are emerging. And it's right, of course, that we should take interest in what's happening. One of the, the clearest marks of a Christian, someone who actually has been born again and has come to know Jesus, is that they love the church and that they're concerned about the church. If somebody has no interest at all in the church and like the welfare of the church, 
then that's a very obvious sign that that person hasn't really got an interest in the life of Jesus. But for all those who know and love him, how the church is faring and how things are going is of number one priority and importance. We need to understand what's really happening and how we respond. What are we to do? Last time we saw then that the glorious good news of this kingdom of heaven goes out everywhere. It's, and it's beautiful and comical in the sense you know, that it's heralded and proclaimed all over the place as it's just being sent out now. And as that happens, it receives a number of very different responses. Some are hard-hearted responses. Just it bounces off. Nothing goes in at all. And the devil just comes and takes it away. And it, all that, that was said, this glorious offer of eternal life and salvation and peace and joy with Jesus is utterly forgotten. And the rugby score or who's going to play in match of the day takes over and all of those massive things, the changed lives forever, completely gone and swallowed up and forgotten. Then there are uh, though, like there's the other response where the shallow response, you know, oh, it all seems quite nice. Yeah, I sort of like that. Until the discomfort, the resistance, the opposition takes place. And then the person says, no, I, I don't really want that. That's not what I thought this kingdom was about. I didn't think I was, I, it was going to have to cost me anything or it was going to affect my life in any way. And then that third response that the things around like choke it out, the cares and worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth, those things choke it out so that it's not fruitful and other things occupy our minds and hearts and attention. But then we saw, isn't it wonderful, that the, the message of the kingdom of heaven falls in good soil among those that just hear and accept and believe. And then there is incredible fruitfulness, 160, 30 times. In other words, amazing things happen when a person just simply listens to and accepts Jesus' words and believes them. We can't even imagine what might happen in a person's life. Now, where it goes next, and we're going to move quite quickly, is to see, well, what, what about that good soil? Uh, what's going to happen to it? Is it going to be just surrounded by those other sort of poorer forms of soil? Or what's going to happen? In this next parable in verses 24 to 30, what Jesus does is changes the gear slightly. And whereas before it was good soil, now it goes to good seed. And then tells the story. And it's very unsettling, but it's also incredibly helpful in helping us understand all that's going on around us within the wider church at the moment. So verses 24 to 30, Jesus tells that story. The man who goes and sows the seed and then, and it's good seed which is sown. And then an enemy comes and sows weeds among it. As they both begin to bear fruit, even though they looked very similar. So the weeds and the wheat looked almost exactly the same, really, to the casual observer. But as they begin to bear fruit, it becomes obvious that it's not just good seed and wheat in this field, but there's also weeds as well. Now, the harvesters are concerned about that. And they're like saying, did you have a mixed bag that you were throwing into the field, which made it uh, turn out this way? And the farmer, the one that sowed the seed, said, no, no, not of course. That's not the explanation. I didn't have a mixed bag of seeds that I threw out, some good, some bad. No, somebody else, this enemy, has come in and sowed those as well. And that's the explanation for this mixed bag. Then uh, the, the servants then said, well, do you want us to kind of go around and to uh, pluck up and take away all those weeds? And the master of the harvest says, no, 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 don't do that. Wait, there'll come a time for that, but not yet. Now, in verse 36, then, the, when it, Jesus leaves the crowd, he left the crowd and went into the house, his disciples came to him. Do you see that? Exactly as he intended and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. So tell us what's going on. 
and Jesus does in verse 37 and explains each part of the story. So he invests each part of that parable with meaning and explains what it is. The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man himself. The field is the world and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are sons of the evil one and the enemy who sows them is the devil and the harvest is the end of the age and the harvesters are angels. Now, what does that, what does that mean? You might say, just put it in a number of steps, very simply. First is that the church in this world, as it is at the moment, is a mixed bag in the way that's the way we might explain it. it's a mixed bag so on the one hand the church in the world is gathered by jesus christ and caught up into fellowship with his father by the power of the holy spirit and joins with the church triumphant in heaven and with all the angels and worship of the living god on the one hand but on the other hand Jesus is not the only agent at work within the church in this world, like the global church, the institutional church, the denominational church, and, turning around, the local church. There is another agency involved as well. Now, that can seem quite troubling, can't you think? No, that couldn't be the case. You know, there couldn't be two powers and two people at work within this local church family here and other local church families and across the denomination and across the global church jesus says there are and we must listen to what he says it's not very wise to disagree with him on this no he knows and understands we saw before that the devil, real, powerful, active in the mind of Jesus, and therefore in the mind of the Christian who trusts Jesus as well, uh, with some people, just takes the word away straight away. So nothing goes in at all, just bounces off. But that's not the only thing which he does. As well as that, he sows weeds within the wider church, within the local church, such that every church is a mixed bag, we might say. Now, there have been all kinds of attempts to prevent that when people have come to the realization that that's actually the case. Uh, there have been, and it's, it's sort of quite funny, really, when you sort of read back to earlier centuries you know so not so long ago i was reading something in the 19th century and they were sort of bewailing the fact of what the church was like in their day and saying oh if only it was like the puritan times then it was amazing and um, now of course it was there were there were many good things about those times but it's good just for us to be aware that it's always been a mixed bag even in the puritan times or even at the time of the reformation or even the time of the church it's always been a mixed bag to one extent or another can we see that, that that's always uh, been the case? And no matter what we might try to do, we, that cannot be changed at this time. So there will be weeds and wheat. We can't change that by some kind of you know, effort to change church governance, as there have been many efforts to go down that road. It just doesn't work. And it doesn't work by all kinds of attempts at church discipline. That just doesn't work either. And even like, you know, the purest form of teaching of the gospel, even that doesn't fully and finally mean an entirely pure church in which all are wheat and all really know and love and trust Jesus. That just cannot be done, Jesus is saying, in these days in which we're living now, the church within the world as it is at the moment. Now, that's helpful for us just to be aware of that, that the church is a mixed bag. It always has been. It won't always be, but it is at the moment. Okay, that helps us 
Um, with, in terms of how we understand wider developments, there are those that are very concerned about what's happening in the wider church, and the response is to sort of say, well, you know, things are happening within the wider church that mean that we have to leave the wider church because we couldn't be caught up in those things, and we want to retain a purer church, and the only way that we can do that is to break away. Um, now, that argument has been made many times before, and yet history, theology, and the Bible, the teaching of the Bible, are against that. Um, I could say more about that, but perhaps we could say more about that again. Those three things stand against that. It, ju it doesn't really work when it's been tried in the past. The teaching of the, the, the great teachers of the Christian church from Augustine through to Calvin are, are against that. And the Bible itself, you know, that Jesus himself envisages that it's a mixed bag within this world. And to leave in that way is just not the solution. Now, it might just be helpful for me to say that I do understand the logic of that position in Northern Ireland. You know, you were nobody if you hadn't set up your own denomination by the age of about 18. So I understand the logic of that position, but it just doesn't work. And that's not the way of Jesus and the way in which he understands things here. It's helpful for us then just to remember that Jesus understands what is going on at the moment. He controls what is going on at the moment. And therefore, we don't need to be alarmed and dismayed. But then the question is then, well, why does he allow it to be like this? Why this mixed bag, either in the local church or in the wider church? Well, he gives the answer here. When the harvesters come to him and say, why don't we just go around and pluck it up? You know, take out all the bad bits now and then all that'll be left will be good. Well, because in verse 29, because while you're pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat as well. Do you see that? Because to really discern between the good and the bad, the wheat and the weeds, between those who really know Jesus and those who seem to but don't actually is actually very difficult and complex. Of course, the way in which we discern is by a person's fruit, by what they say, what they do. That's how we can discern, but it's often very difficult to really discern what a person actually is. And then moving on from that, as he says, if the weeds are pulled up, it would affect the wheat as well. I um, I always try to do as little gardening as I possibly can, but uh, Della sometimes drags me into the garden, and I always feel very frustrated because it feels like almost all of my time is dealing with weeds. It's probably because I don't spend enough time in the garden. If I spent more time, I wouldn't be dealing with weeds all the time. But my, with my limited knowledge of gardening and my limited experience of those things, what I invariably find is that weeds are so tough and so difficult to get rid of, whereas on the other hand, plants are very fragile and can be killed very, very easily. In a small patch of ground, what I tend to find happens is that the weeds will wrap themselves around plants and that trying to extricate the weed from the plant is very difficult. And with my ineptness and clumsiness, I tend to kill the plant, and the weed tends to survive the whole process. Now, can you see, like, that same principle applies with the weeds and the wheat within, like, a local church and within, like, a wider church? Those that are weeds do, over a long period of time, entangle themselves in, in lives in a way that it's very, very difficult for, the, for them to be extricated without doing real damage to the wheat, to those who really do know and trust Jesus Christ. Jesus' concern is for the wheat. He loves the wheat. He loves those who know and love him, and he wants to protect them at all costs, even if it means the weeds have to stay for a little bit longer. Now, he does that as an act of great patience. Not only for the sake of the wheat, of course, but also because in his mercy and kindness, he's able to do something which no gardener, as far as I'm aware, is able to do. 
He is able to change and turn weeds into wheat. So if as you hear this and you think, wow, this is sort of unsettling. I couldn't imagine that within a local church family, there are those that know Jesus and those that don't. And as I think about the fruit of my own heart and life, I'm not sure that it really is good fruit. I'm not entirely sure that I really am, that I have assurance of my sins forgiven, that I know Jesus and that he knows me and loves me. And I fear that I, I might be one of the weeds through the things that I've said and thought and done. Go to Jesus and ask him to change you and transform you. Because there is a day coming. The church is a mixed bag now and for good reason. The Lord is patient and kind and does it for the good of the weeds and the wheat. But there is a time coming in which there will be judgment. And on that day, Jesus will be able to distinguish and to see what you are and what we all are. Everything's open and laid bare before him. I came across those old Proverbs in Proverbs chapter 20. Here Jesus describes himself as the, as the son of man. But Proverbs chapter 20 verse 8 puts it like this. When a king sits on his throne to judge, he winnows out all evil with his eyes. It's not powerful like he sees things as they really are. And on that day, he will send out his harvesters, his angels, and they will gather the wheat into the barn to be with him. And they will take away the weeds into the, the way in which he describes it in verse 42. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's not striking and scary. We can't back away from it. We must listen to what Jesus says and face up to it. That there only are two possible destinies for each one of us. And that being sent outside into that outer darkness is a terrible prospect. None of us want to go there. We go to Jesus ask him for forgiveness so that when that day of harvest comes we will be gathered in to that barn and to that life which he has in store for all those who know and love him now let me just rush on from that parable of course where what we could be left thinking was oh dear you know what what does this mean then you know so this means that there, of all, when when the message of this kingdom goes out, that there are these four responses, and there's only one response in which there's any fruit, and then that fruitful seed is surrounded by all kinds of weeds that entangle themselves around it. What hope is there? We could be forgiven, perhaps, for thinking that and feeling that in our hearts. And that's why it's so beautiful what Jesus goes on to say next. And I'm going to just rush through these remaining parables. In verse 31, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it's the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it's the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. In other words, it starts and begins small. And you think, oh, there's nothing going to come of that. What could possibly come of that when there's so much against it? And yet this very small little thing grows uh, to the largest of plants in which the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. Now, if you've seen a picture of a mustard like planter tree, you'll know that it's not actually that big. It, it doesn't really seem to be big enough to have these huge branches that birds come and perch in. So what's Jesus saying? Is it that he didn't know what mustard plants or trees look like? No, of course he did. What's he saying? He's saying that this kingdom starts small but grows and exceeds all expectations. The same as the 60, uh, the, the 160 or 30 
times of before. And that's always the way Jesus' kingdom advances. Those small group of nobodies, 12 men, what could they possibly do? What could possibly be done with them? A lot could be done with them. The world was changed by them. Again and again throughout history, the Lord has done wonderful things through a single man who didn't even really quite know what he was doing, who just went and nailed a piece of paper onto a door in Wittenberg and Europe and the world was changed. A small group of elderly women who just set themselves to praying that God might revive the church and the church was revived. Small things that create, go on to produce results that exceed all kinds of expectations. And then the kingdom of heaven is like yeast. Jesus goes on to say that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour in verse 33 until it worked all through the dough. Now, that's an interesting one. You've got to think about that one because yeast generally in the Bible is represents something not good. So Sodom and Gomorrah, the Passover, and then the way that Jesus uses it with the religious leaders and the Gospels and speaking about Herod as well. There is one occasion when yeast is used in a good sense, and it's at the Feast of Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks as the church goes global all across the world. So I think what Jesus is saying here is that the church will, like this kingdom will spread all across the whole world and transform the world again. Then Jesus goes on in verses 44 and 45 to these two beautiful little parables in which the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, a man sort of stumbles upon it, and then when he found it, he hid it again, and then with joy went and sold all he had and bought that field so that he could get the treasure that was inside it. And then again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. So this time the man was actually looking for it, didn't sort of stumble across it, but looking for it very deliberately. And then when he found one of great value, went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Now, there's a lot going on in those two parables. Let's just put it like this. This kingdom of Jesus Christ, when we see the value of this kingdom and to be a part of it, then we gladly give up everything. Gladly, with joy, we consider everything else rubbish, as Paul the Apostle says, compared to the over. Joy, the overfilling joy of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. Everything else, we gladly give it up in order to be a part of this wonderful kingdom of Jesus. And But why do we do that? Because he gave up everything for us. The man in both these parables is a little bit like us, but a little bit like him as well. On this Valentine's Day... Some of us may be feeling, you know, thinking, I, I didn't get a card today. And I feel other people maybe did. And I just don't know if there's anyone who really loves me in that way today. Whether you got a Valentine's card or not, your God, your Jesus, loved you more than his own life. More than giving you a Valentine's Day card, he loved you so much that he died for you. He values you. You are more precious to him than you could ever possibly imagine or even take in. He loves you. His kingdom is not like the kingdoms of this passing world. You know, the kingdom of Alexander the Great or the kingdoms of Napoleon or the kingdoms of so many others that were built on the backs of others. Others paid the price for the advance of those kingdoms. No, his kingdom is one in which he pays the price. And because of that, we gladly give up everything for him. Then he draws to a close with this other king, this other parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a net, like the net is going right across the world. And drawing in 
good and bad, those good and bad will be separated again on that last and great day of judgment. So let's draw things to a close. Jesus says in verse 51, have you understood these things? I know I've rushed through them, but have we understood these things? Let's think about them more, think about each parable more and take to heart what Jesus is saying. He's saying that now the church is a mixed bag. It doesn't mean to say that we accept that and do nothing. No, within that we stand for him. We lift his banner high. We proclaim Jesus with all that we are and all that we have. But we do that knowing that the church will not be made pure completely until Jesus comes again. But in the midst of that, he does great things from small beginnings. Let's not be afraid to trust him to use us in the advance of his kingdom and his glory that he might start small things in our lives that would grow big and spread right across this land. That in that kingdom of Jesus Christ in which he's given everything for us, let's give everything for him. Let's lay down our lives at our feet, at his feet. Let's surrender them all to him, knowing that he is in control. He knows what's going on. He has good reasons for allowing what is happening. And there is coming a day, as Augustine put it so long ago, O oh, you Christians whose lives are good, you sigh and groan, as being few among many. The winter will pass away, the summer will come. Lo, the harvest will soon be here. And then we who know and love him will be gathered into that glorious barn. We will shine like, the, like that light of his father shining through us and we will reign with him the beginning of the world as it always should have been. Let's give all that we have, all that we can in the cause of his kingdom and for his glory. Therefore, to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be ascribed all the glory, all the honor, all the praise, now and forever. Amen.